Shall we bow our heads in order of prayer? Father, again we come in the precious name of Jesus, asking for a new anointing from heaven and for divine illumination upon the Word. Speak to our hearts once again, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, my dear ones, if you don't get anything else other than the little short message Brother Oliver gave you, you've got a treasure, and it'll be worth coming for tonight. What he said on faith, if you can get a hold of that, I tell you, it'll steer you through many of of a disappointment, many of a heartache, many a struggle. It'll relieve it from you. If you can get a hold of that, I trust God helps us remember it. It's so precious. Thank you, Jesus. It's so rare because I hardly know of anywhere in the world where you'd hear it. I really don't know of hardly anywhere in the world outside of Brother Hill's ministry. Now, I no doubt there's others that are doing it. I mean, I'm just not acquainted with it, you know. But uh, so you can be thankful that you heard tonight what you heard. It'll save you a lot of difficulty. Well, tonight, if you have your Bibles, I want us to turn to the book of Genesis, the, the second chapter. Genesis, the second chapter. And I want to begin reading with the 19th verse. Genesis 2, starting with verse 19. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. For Adam, for Adam there was not found in help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. May the Lord add his blessing for the reading of his precious word. I want you to notice here that all of the animals were made out of the dust of the ground but the woman. Uh, he made, the woman was made differently from all the other animals and all creation, out of all creation. The woman was made differently. Now she was still dust, but God made her differently. Now I want you to notice something. When God does something, he's trying to tell us something. He doesn't want to just do something different. He's trying to tell us something. So there must be something unique about this for God to do it this way, or he wouldn't have done it. He could have made her out of the dust of the ground, brought her to Adam, and she would have been exactly the same composition, not the slightest difference of anything whatsoever. She'd have been the same woman in every way, but she wouldn't have fulfilled the purpose that God has. Now... God could have, as I said, created her that way, but he didn't because God wanted them to be one. And God never said that of any of the animals. Adam and Eve, then God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And they were to have a family and that family was to be a special unit on the earth. Now God could have, could have created all the children that he wanted out of the dust of the ground. It would have been no problem to God whatsoever. And just like the angels of creating them all separately, he could have created us all separately if he'd have wanted to. It would have been no problem to God. His power was great. He could have done it if he'd have wanted to. <clears throat> but God wanted a family unit. God wanted them to have the joy of having children, and the family unit is a special, is special to God. I wish we knew how special it was. Adam and Eve, in a sense, since they all, the human family came from them, in a sense, we're all related. 
But God had a special unit in the family and uh, he had a special unit in designing this way. When God called Abraham to follow him, he called the whole family. He didn't call just Abraham. He called everybody in that family <clears throat> because he was calling and speaking to a unit. And God had a special purpose, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> God had a special purpose for Abraham's family. God did not use Abraham for a while and then turn around and use somebody else. He never jumped out of that family. Because the family had a special unit to God. When God called Abraham, he called the whole family. And God uh, called Abraham and then called Isaac and then called Jacob and then called his sons. And God formed a nation out of Israel from Abraham's family. That's really what the nation of Israel is family. God wanted Israel to be a family and not an organization of people. God is still working with that family today. And not like Babel, where Babel was an organization of separate people. <clears throat> there was no family connected with Babel. That's the devil's way. Organize a group of people and get done what God, what, what the devil wants done is <clears throat> an organization of people, but God chooses a family. And he works through that family. So the devil's method of operating uh, is on the basis of an organization or a confederation of people getting together to accomplish and do his will in the world. But God chooses a family. Now there are certain truths that can only be taught by a family relationship. God knew what he was doing. In a family, you are part of each other. One, you're one unit. The Bible says to honor your father and your mother. For how long? Well, as long as they're living. I think it's beautiful in the story of Joseph, if you'll read that, uh, when Jacob, as an old man, was dying, and Joseph went to visit his father as an old man. Now, Joseph was the ruler of Egypt. Everywhere Joseph went, people bowed the knee to this man. Somebody went ahead and said, bow the knee to them. He was the only, he was under Pharaoh, and everybody except Pharaoh bowed the knee to this man, Joseph. But when Joseph got to his father, Joseph bowed to his father. That relationship never changed. I don't care how great Joseph got. He never, uh, he never got great enough to outgrow that relationship. His father was always the unit that God chose, and he was always the head of Joseph. I don't care how great Joseph got. He was still Jacob's son. So Joseph, we find him bowing before Joseph, and you can't get great enough to outgrow a family relationship. Joseph was Jacob's son, and no matter how great he became, when he went home, brother, he bowed before his father. Now the devil has done all he can to destroy this special unit in God's economy. Hitler tried it. He said, give us the children and we'll make a super race. And he found out that it didn't work. Communism tried it. They said, all we want to the women, give us these children and we'll raise communists for the state and we'll conquer the world and have the greatest thing in the world. And they found out it wouldn't work. You can't bypass God's family. And even communism has come back to recognize there must be a family unit in that nation for them to succeed. The stability of a nation rests upon the family. The mark of a true religion is the family relationship and unit will be restored. The fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. That relationship will be, that's the mark of true religion. But I want to look a little bit at the church. God never meant for the church to be an organization. He never meant it to be a place for just a group of people gathered together and worship God and say, I'm going off to church as an individual and come in here as individuals and worship God as an individual and go home. God never meant that. That's not a church. 
God never meant the church to be an organization, and yet that's what many Christians or many churches turn out to be, something that you join in a place where you have a membership and a place where you go and worship God, and then you go home and you live by yourself. That is not God's church. The church is a family. You're coming to your family when you gather here on Sunday. These are your brothers and sisters, and Jesus, your elder brother, and God's your father, and we're a family that worship together. This special unit, God wants it, the devil hates it, and he'll do all he can to destroy the family in the home out there, and he'll do all he can to destroy this family because it's special to God. The church is a family. God is our father. Jesus, our elder brothers. And we're brothers and sisters. And the work of the Holy Spirit, as someone said, is done by the Holy Spirit. At Pentecost, it was the Holy Spirit as the mother giving birth to thousands of souls through the church. I love what it says there in what is it, in Psalms, the 87th Psalm, speaking of Zion. 87th Psalm, he said, and of Zion it shall be said, this man was born in her, and the highest of himself shall establish it. And the Lord shall count when he writeth up the people that this man was born there. This man and that man was born in her. That's what you can say of the church. You say, oh, I joined the church, brother. If you got in it, you were born in it. And you were born into a family. You didn't join anything. God has a special unit in a special way. Why? Because God has a special unit for this family. God has put it there. So God has a special work for the family, the church. And he has joined us together in one, just one. In Ephesians 4, 16, he says, One body fitly joined together, compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working which measure, measure every part, maketh the increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. One body joined together. This family will be a unit forever, bringing glory to God. It'll never be separated. Some in this family have already gone to heaven, but I want you to know it'll be a family forever, still a unit there bringing glory to God. We'll not be individuals in heaven. So God has his ways and his purposes, and there, can, there, can, there are lessons that can be learned only by living in a family that can't be learned in an organization. Lessons of love and patience and and uh, concern and caring and belonging and forgiveness and concern. You can't learn that in an organization. And that's why God puts us together. Where, where in the world can you learn something that you can learn in a family? That's where people get next to each other. That's where they get close to each other. That's where one brother knows what another brother's like and another sister, she knows what another... The world may not know, but your family knows what you're like. And that's why we come together as God and we learn what the family's like. I know what my sister's like and my brother. We're still part of the family, the family that God made. It's a unit that belongs to God. And there's there where we learn from each other and we learn things we couldn't learn anywhere else. So God put us in a family. And from each other, we're going to learn things we never could learn from going out and joining an organization. When God puts me in with a brother and sister with you, I'm going to learn what you're like. And you're going to learn what I'm like. And we learn patience from each other and, and how to get along together. All kinds of things. God's teaching us things that couldn't be taught anywhere else in the world. And if there's any place you can get rubbed the wrong way, it'll be in your family. Because they don't mind letting their hair down to you. If they don't like what you're doing, they'll tell you about it. An organization won't say anything. They'll still smile and you go away and they don't know you and you don't know them. But in the church, we know each other. We're brothers and sisters in the family of God. God is a special unit here. We're training each other in a way that could never be trained anywhere. Then let God deal with us. If something rubs us the wrong way, well, let's go and pray about it if we've got to. But brother, this is the unit God put in to make saints out of us. Yes. Thank God for his family. There are lessons that can only be learned in a family and can't be learned in an organization any other way. Oh, I'm thankful what God does. I'm glad also that what you were in the world has nothing to do with what you are in the church. <laughs> I think of dear Rahab the harlot. 
Oh, brother, I want to tell you, I believe when she brought those spies in and said, I believe in God, and she hid them, I believe she got saved right there. I want to tell you, I was thinking here, well, this dear woman, I want to tell you, she was a harlot in Jericho, but she was a mother in Israel. That's right. Glory! Oh, Hallelujah to God. She was a different person in God's family. God put her in the family of God, married a prince of Israel, and put him in, put her in the lineage of Jesus. Why? What she was in Jericho didn't make any difference what she was in the church. And when a person comes out of the world and puts in the, God's family, you're a different person, a new person in Jesus Christ. It doesn't make any difference what you wear in the world. It's what you are in this family that counts. Because this family is eternal. And this is what God wants to do with us. So God made the transformation in, in uh, Rahab, and he's the one who makes the, tra the transformation in us today. So today we need to resist anything that would divide the church. We need to resist it. It's of the devil. Resist the devil. We need to desire and deny self and follow Jesus. Uh, I tell you, if we knew how much refining we needed on ourselves, why, well, no wonder God put us in this family. We need to help each other in that way. When Zion travails, she'll bring forth children. And they all, all are in the family. Everybody. It doesn't make it ever smooth. They are high and low. We're all part of a family. I thought one of the most beautiful things that I've seen in years was uh, dear Brother Smith, who used to be on the missionary board in uh, Anderson, Indiana. He pastored over here in Huntington. Some of you may have known him. I held a revival with Brother Royer in Huntington and stayed with his dear wife uh, after Brother Smith had passed away. And they had a daughter that probably didn't, I'm not sure, she may have had the mind of a two, two-year-old. Anyway, she couldn't talk. She could make sounds the mother could understand. I think when I was there, she must have been about 30 years of old, 30 years of age. But I want to tell you, I never saw it. It was a beautiful relationship. That girl was part of the family. They received her as part of the family. They introduced her as part of the family. She sat at the table with us. She went to church with them. Wherever she went, they went. And they made no apologies for this girl. And they simply received her. She was part of the family. And they accepted it. It was a beautiful sight to behold. She was part of the family. And that's the way it is in the church. <laughs> God's got all kinds of children in the church, but we're family. We're a family. I remember uh, reading as a, or hearing the story, uh, and I can't vouch for it, but it could have been true. Beautiful story, but the spiritual truth is there. During the Civil War, after the Civil War, somebody went to, a veteran, I think, went to see the President of the United States to petition something. They told him he could sit in a certain room, and if there was time, the President would see him. And so he stayed there, and there was a little boy playing around, and uh, to occupy the time, he played games with the little boy all afternoon. And finally, at the end of the day, the man said, well, I guess I'll have to go home. Now, he traveled a long way to get there. And he said, but I'm going to have to go home. I won't be able to see you anymore. I'm going to say goodbye to you. And the little, he said, I hope to see the president, but couldn't get to see him. The little boy said, but did you want to see the president? And he said, yes, I did. He said, well, you come with me. So that little fellow took him past all the secretaries and guards and down the hall, went into a room and said, Dad, this man's been come a long way to see you, and uh, I, he's been playing with me all afternoon games, and I didn't want him to go, he's my friend, I, or something like that, I, I didn't want him to go home without meeting you. And the president listened to him and gave him the request that he had, but I want you to know that little boy had privileges that nobody else had. He had privileges that no general had, no man of state had, because that was his father. And this is a beautiful thing that I marvel at, is that when a child of God is born into God's family, I want you to know he's got some privileges that nobody else in all the world has. He can walk into the throne room of heaven and say, Father, I can't get over that. The great God of heaven, the great creator of all the universe, that when I'm born, you know, he puts his spirit within me to cry out the Father. Instead of coming in like the heathen, they say, Oh, great spirit, I can cry and say, Father, 
What a difference because I have the privilege, because I'm a child of God and God makes us a child of God. He's put us in a family. He's our father and I've got privileges that nobody else in the world has unless you're a child of God. But we've got that wonderful, marvelous privilege because God puts us that. And I want to tell you, that's why the beautiful scripture there in Hebrews to come boldly to the throne of grace. What a marvelous privilege. Marvelous privilege that I have the privilege, dear ones, that there isn't anybody in heaven, earth, or hell can keep me from the throne of God because that's my privilege as a child of God. God gave me that privilege and he gave it to you. There isn't any demon of hell can keep me out. There isn't anybody in heaven. There isn't anybody on earth. There isn't any boards or committees or anything can say you can't get to the throne. Jesus said, you're a son. You can come anytime. You've got the privilege to come any time of the day or night. Don't you worry about it. You come to me. What a privilege as a son of God. And God gives us this privilege, a family unit. Oh, God wants us a family, dear ones. And if we have to put up with some, each other's uh, difficulties and, as they say, idiosyncrasies, then let's put up with them. We're still a family because God's teaching us something here you can't learn anywhere else in the world. You can't learn it by just being alone and trying to worship God alone. If you really get next to God and listen to God, he'll say, well, get back with the family. And you live with them. You learn from them. May God will help us.